Relating to what you can uh, kill, what you can use to kill weeds on the highway changed. There's this thing called residuals. I don't know if, probably in your garden you use residual weed killer, which is you put it down, and it means that when. Uh, <laughs> side of it stayed in there for up, up to about three years ago, that's where we started to see a deterioration. 
Um, now they're only able to use glyphosate. Whereas the residual, when that was in the soil, or the cracks of the curves, any, any germ, any weeds have germinated, it killed as they germinated. But now, obviously that residual is not there over the last three years. So we're only using glyphosate. So we can actually spray an area one day, and tomorrow the weeds could germinate, and they could start growing until we get back round again. Yeah. So in addition to that, you know, the birds was explaining about <coughs> so much um, wet days this year, whereas last year was a lot of wet days and not so many windy days. Uh, this year we've had, it usually we've had about 90 working days out of our allocation that we haven't been able to get out of spray, either wet or windy. And it's mainly been the wind this year. And the simple reason is it's not safe for our operators because of the drift. split uh, the whole of the world into 19 sections. Uh, I was speaking to uh, Joe this afternoon and I'm going to look at trying to split it into four constituency areas which I think might work better. Uh, and in each of those areas we'll get a list of roads and we'll set up a web page and we'll show you know, the grass cutting web page that we've got up already for our grass cutting on a similar basis to that. My team can come back to me, let me know where they spray. I will fill in the you know, information on the web, and then if there's a comments column. So if, if the 
lads come back to me and say, we can't spray there, there's loads of cars parked up there. At least I can put a comment on there so that the residents then can actually have a look and see why it's not there. But again, you're not going to see these results around two or three weeks later after we've sprayed. Unless we have really sunny, dry, wind, windless days and then we'll end up seeing results in about seven, seven to eight days using glyphosate. But the more wet and windy it is, the longer the, the weaker it takes to kill. So just, uh, just one final thing, if, if there's a, uh, <coughs> a very cold winter and there's lots of gritty, that's, that's helpful because we just don't like salt. Do you want us to talk about the... Any, any questions? Have you ever tried using salt like the Canadians do? They use the salt. Yeah. Not diet, not, not don't put it in water and you just sprinkle it all over yeah. and then let the rain. They don't come back once, they, once yeah. you've done it. Steve's also been to um, the School of Immunity Forum, which looks at how you deal with weeds, because obviously it is a question of how an area looks if it's to deal with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a very good uh, there's a thing coming out which I've asked for information for as well, because we have not heard of it before. It's a, like a vinegar solution, a thing that they go around and spray, and apparently that works quite well abroad. So I've asked for information as soon as I get information I can share. Now just start with you, Brian. Yeah, thanks, yeah. I don't know whether there's anybody in the beach wood, but I've recently passed on complaints from the beach wood about weeds. I was assured a week or so ago that it's now all been done. But as you say yourself, it's probably too early for residents to tell. Do you know, has the beach wood all been yes, seen now? The beach wood been completed. Yeah. 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 So we should hopefully see that. So, you know, people are, are intelligent, people of will are intelligent enough to understand that A, the legislation's changed, so the type of product has changed. I don't know any other way we would get a fairly complicated story out to the public other than telling them through our own publication because that, 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 what, what we've had to do here, you know, for a small number of people, if we can tell that story to every household, at least people have to the in front of them, the technical and the reasons why, and how to access the web website and so on. So these are exactly the sort of issues I think that could well feature in maybe the next publication, or a timely publication, maybe yeah. a spring or whatever, um, to inform the public about what we're trying to do, what the, what the problems are, and what, what, how people can, can help themselves. So, so, so my view is, if, if we get our issues like this at one constituency, that will generally be of interest around the border, I think we should be fair to the <coughs> for, for some airing. Uh,
passed on that there was a concern that um, that maybe if people are using, if people are driving <laughs> their pathways uh, a little bit too fast, then you're not going to get then get the, the spray where you want it. And in, in the past, they, they used to walk around spraying. And wasn't that slightly more effective if you see it as George refers to some sort of push? You, you can give it a good. <laughs>
Christian wife says up to her around her 2017. Well, that's enough. Well, we can talk then when the flight is in, we continue. So this time next year, the flight is in. Um, so, um, last um, August, September, Wirral uh, um, went through um, two periods of really intense rainfall. Um, and as a result of those rainfall incidents in August and September, uh, it triggered, uh, well, it caused internal flooding to something like around approximately 100 properties over those two events. And that triggered uh, a legislative requirement to undertake uh, what they call a Section 19 flood investigation, which is, as a lead local flood authority, which the council is, meant we had to call all partners in and we had to do an investigation into the causes and what can be done to try and deal with uh, flooding of that type uh, if it happens again. Uh, as a result of that, and given that it was uh, quite unprecedented levels of uh, flooding and damage to properties, um, the decision was taken to uh, seek an independent organisation to undertake that investigation and the council commissioned ACON to do that. And as a result of the finishing of that flood investigation, uh, it was requested by the um, uh, 
uh, the flood group and the portfolio holder uh, to go round each of the constituency committees to do a short presentation to explain what went on, what the lessons learned from that are, uh, and uh, to answer any particular questions there may be. So, what we've done, and this is the last of the four constituency committees that we're covering in terms of this part of the uh, public um, um, consultation, if you like, around this, this investigation, is we've got some people who I'm just going to introduce. So, Ruth Goodall from ACOB is going to do the presentation. They were the organisation who were commissioned to undertake the investigation. Um, and we've got two chaps, Barry Cropper and Peter Torboys from United Utilities. And we've got Neil Thomas um, in, in a role of the lead local flood authority or the council. We've unfortunately at the last minute got apologies from United, uh, sorry, from the Environment Agency uh, who, who have attended the other three. And I've agreed that if there's any questions relating directly to the Environment Agency, I'll take them away. And uh, if I can't, if we can't answer them, I'll take them away and get them the answers produced in the minutes uh, of the of the um, of the of this meeting. Um, so, what I'm going to propose is that we ask Ruth to do the presentation and then uh, at the end of that presentation there will be an opportunity where I'll come back up and we'll facilitate any questions there might be uh, to, to that presentation. Thank you. 
rainfall was more than the sewers are actually designed to cope with. Um, there was some surface water flooding, which um, <coughs> is a term that refers to uh, flooding where the water never even gets into the drains at all, just didn't even get that far. Um, and then there were a lot of incidences of combined flooding, so where all of those three things happen. So this is the map, um, so the little orange circles, if you can see them, I hope. Um, so this is the August event, um, so right at the end of August. Um, which we did look at, there's a lot less, there's a lot less information for, there was a lot less properties flooded. Um, you can see, you can see there, the um, areas where there were clusters of flooded properties. Um, in that event, there were only, across the world, only seven reports of internal property flooding during that event. Um, so it was much smaller. And that is the September event. Um, so much more widespread, um, perhaps worse in other areas of the world than it was in Birkenhead. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of properties flooded, um, and we'll come on later to the, the actual numbers, but let's say hundreds of, of properties impacted. Um, a lot of infrastructure, roads um, flooded as well, which caused problems. And I'll come on to talk about um, just now a specific burden head example, which is actually where there was no property flooding, but there was um, road flooding that severely impacted business. Um, so a lot of Cheshire trains.
so clinging to resilience is a key theme. Um, it's important because it means people can respond to the flooding themselves and they don't have to sit and wait for a response from the council or the emergency services, which, you know, when things are prioritised can be a long time coming when you've got over, you know, over 150 households flooding. Um, and because of the future climate change likely to potentially increase um, the probability of things like this happening. So, so it's all about being prepared, it's about knowing that you're potentially at risk of flooding and having something in your home that can help you respond to flooding rather than having to bring up and, and ask for you know ask for help really. Um, and it can be really effective if you keep the water out of your house and it, it, it um, you know you can just take the thing down and carry on as normal as the flood water receives, whereas you know if you can't keep the water out then it's it's a lot more damaging. Um, and this is just um, just the final slide really. Um, as part of the data collection for the section 19, we did um, a survey. Um, so there was a survey online on the council's uh, website, and when we were around um, doing data collection, visiting the flooded areas and talking to residents, we asked them to fill in the survey as well. Um, so all of these survey responses were from people who had flooded during August and September. Um, and the green sections of these pie charts are uh, effectively no, and that's a slightly counterintuitive on the brain. Um, but 59% of people asked, do you know how to find out if you might be at risk of flooding? 59% of people who actually flooded said they didn't know how to get that information. Um, have you got a personal flood plan? So have you got an idea of what you're going to do if you've got a warning? 76% of people said no, they have. These are the people who flooded. Um, do you know how to get flood warnings? 61% said no. Do you know how you would improve your property's flood protection? 57% said no. And I think that's, the, that's why resilience is so important and, and, and that's one of the key Parts of the council's response to the flooding is helping communities to understand what they can do to help themselves. This is the end. So, just in summary, so both flood events really resulted from very significant rainfall over a very short period. Um, the flooding came from um, a lot of different sources with very little warning, well, no warning, um, and all of the agencies and all of the agencies and organisations involved in managing flood risk in the world. We're responding to the flood as it unfolded. Um, the slow capture and exchange of information did limit the effectiveness of the response. Um, and the Section 19 flood investigation has, as a result, made recommendations to improve communications and the resilience of communities at risk very specifically. And we can talk a little bit more um, after that if you've got questions about how that is actually being delivered um, afterwards. So, thank you very much for your time. Can I just say a couple of other things just before questions? So, I just, just, thanks very much, Ruth. Um, whilst, whilst I think it would be fair to say that Birkenhead on those events didn't suffer as much internal flooding as properties in other areas of Wirral, I think what we need to point out is there is an ever-increasing risk of these high-intensity weather patterns, whether they be rain, snow, cold, affecting the borough. And really what the idea of this investigation around flooding specifically is so that we as uh, flood risk agencies can understand what we can do differently to one hopefully prevent that flooding affecting so many people and properties again and two to understand how the, the hydrology almost works across the, across the borough and, and just a couple of things we've done since then so first of all the section 19 investigation report and there's about eight of them from weather events eight or nine of them they're all available on the on the council's website you need to google section 19 or flooding and they're all there and you can drill down to the detail of each of those areas that suffered specific flooding and 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 you can get an understanding but the north cheshire train estate the Durley, is quite an interesting one no internal properties flooded uh, the road, we couldn't get vehicles through, so the impact on us as flood authorities is that the other side of that water is Scottish Power Energy Networks with their major incident room, and they couldn't get through, and so our contractor was on the other side, so when we talk about response and business continuity, that was one of the things we were trying to deal with at that time. I think we need to put a, a bit of a shout out, they're not here tonight, but the fire service and the environment agency did a fantastic job in responding at the time out to those areas that were affected. It was a little bit slower and we put our hands up and doing things around how the council and other agencies can get together and work together more coherently in those responses. 
We've, we've, we've um, in terms of the actual recommendations in there, there is, a, there is an action plan, as you would expect, that the, the officers and, and uh, is, is being followed by the scrutiny uh, uh, committee to ensure that we keep on track in terms of dealing with those actions and keeping members and the public up to date with what we're doing. But just some of the quick wins that we're doing is We've worked with uh, Sefton on a procurement exercise which is closed only recently so that we purchase 3,000 um, modern equivalents of sandbags, if you like. They're called hydro sacks, so they actually inflate and expand on contact with water. Easier to store, easier to get out to people. And we're going to issue some of those to each of those properties who, who experienced internal flooding on, on those so they get a stock given to them and the council will retain, retain a stock to protect its own infrastructure but also to be there to assist those properties and those vulnerable people at times when they need it. So that's, that's one of the quick wins we've done. And then the, the other bit that we're doing is that through our um, local uh, levy funding with the Environment Agency, we've applied for um, some quick win uh, funding uh, to the value of £50,000. And with that £50,000, you heard them talk about community resilience there. And really the, one of the startling things is 78% of people who had suffered internal flooding have chose not to do anything about that just really waiting for the next time for it to happen. So one of the things we think we're gonna do with that money is to send um, surveyors out, specific surveyors, to look at their property and give those uh, residents um, an idea on things that they can, they can undertake to protect their property and protect the extent of flooding uh, in there. And you saw one of those on one of the photos, like a door sill barrier or a flood barrier. Pretty low cost, but I accept that there will be time